Welcome to Trade Finance Talks, a podcast from Trade Finance Global. During this series, we'll be hearing from global experts, as well as learning about the latest trends, technology and insights in the world of international trade and receivables finance. Episode 3 I'm Dipesh Patel, editor at Trade Finance Global. Trade is changing rapidly. Aside from the macroeconomic and geopolitical challenges we see today, the digitalization of the hugely complex supply chain is anything but straightforward. It's a physical problem. We have exporters, importers, freight forwarders and financiers. But ultimately, a lot of the challenges surface around data and the exchange of that data. Blockchain and distributed ledger technology presents an opportunity here to digitalise trade, but also comes with its challenges. Later on today, we're going to be hearing from Alyssa DiCaprio, Head of Trade and Supply Chain at R3. Alyssa is a leader and at the front line of blockchain technology, looking after standards, governance design and trade strategy at R3. We mentioned in last week's podcast, these are so important for making trade digital. Alyssa joined R3 from the Asian Development Bank, where she looked after digital trade, trade finance and innovation as a senior economist. So without further ado, here's Alyssa DiCaprio joining us from New York. Hi Alyssa, thank you very much for joining us on today's podcast. I'm excited to be here. So, Elevator Pitch, what's your story and what does R3 do? Great. Well, R3 uh, is an enterprise software company that builds and maintains the blockchain platform called Corda. We actually started out as a consulting company where we were building applications in blockchain for a consortium of banks. And we were building on various blockchain platforms. We were building on Ethereum, on multi-chain. But we quickly realized when it got to deployment that there was no regulated financial institution that was going to deploy a public blockchain in their internal systems. So we went back, we surveyed our member banks, and we asked them what they would need a blockchain to do. They told us. We took that back and we built Corda from the ground up with requirements of the financial institutions that were members of our consortium. Great. Thank you. So let's start with a helicopter view on global trade. Trade is reportedly worth some nine trillion US dollars per year, yet according to consistent reports and statistics from the ADB and ICC, we have a one and a half trillion US dollar trade finance gap, mostly due to SMEs and emerging markets who can't access finance to trade overseas. We know trade is an engine for economic growth, so what exactly is causing this problem? I think this is a terrific question, and I've been working on this particular issue for a long time. That number was calculated by the team that I ran when I was at ADB. And what we know about that trade finance gap, like you mentioned, it's mostly SMEs, mostly emerging markets. And the cause for this is really about visibility. Small and medium-sized enterprises are terrible at signaling their fitness to be financed. So a lot of the finance requests that go unmet are not necessarily because the SME is a high risk proposition. It can be anything from the fact that the SME doesn't have the the proper paperwork or hasn't recorded the transactions in the right way to potential concerns about KYC that can't be verified uh, because the data isn't there. We've already recognized that small and medium sized enterprises are a potentially valuable market And their ability to be financed is something that's important, both from a bank perspective and also from a development perspective. So I think the entire industry is really together in understanding that and seeking to solve that problem. And there's some really interesting ways that blockchain is being applied that will be able to do that. I strongly believe that. Thanks, Alyssa. So just following on for that, and and I guess going into a little more detail, you've written or your team have written a number of papers on trade and blockchain and the potential. And I guess we're here to get an overview of blockchain for trade and supply chain. But let's turn it around and talk about the customer pain points. So from a bank's perspective, what are the current pain points and challenges for these customers? 
Well, when you're talking about from a bank perspective, there's really two things that blockchain seeks to solve that are current pain points. And the first one is what we just discussed. It's really about visibility. Where are the goods? Where are the documents? Are they the correct documents? Do they have the right data in them? And the second is about reconciliation. And this is similar, but, but not exactly the same. So in trade, you have various documents that are exchanged between different systems. Some of those systems are already electronic, but the problem is they don't talk to each other. So for example, you may have a completely digital banking system, but then when you're taking in the different pieces of data and information from the buyers and suppliers, they're using a different digital system. So you're not actually able to talk with each other. You're inputting the data yourself manually that you've imported from the partners. So reconciliation is a big problem. And particularly in trade where you're amending documents all of the time, different parties are amending them, but then all of the parties need to see and agree to those amendments. So it really slows down the process a lot. So those are really the two things that I see as, as the current pain points that a blockchain could address. Thank you. So reconciliation and the exchange of data. So let's go into a bit more about digitalization. As you mentioned earlier, it's not a new concept and there has been a lot going on in the past to try and make attempts to digitalize trade. In this case, we're talking about e-bills of lading, EUCP standards, the bank purchase obligation and OCR techniques. Are these not good enough instruments on the market right now? Those are all very good instruments that are being built by our partners, Uh, but I think they all have challenges. And I think what it boils down to is that each of these is very different, but really what it boils down to is that it's easy to make something digital, but you really need to build a lot more into the ecosystem in order to allow for ease of usage and expansion of the ecosystem. So how do you build the network effect is really where it becomes challenging. So with bills of lading, for example, we do have electronic bills of lading, and there's lots and lots and lots of parties that have built different systems that can allow for electronic bills of lading. But there's really only three companies that have been P&I certified. So when you talk about electronic bills of lading, even though the general population that could build those is very large, the actual functioning population is, is quite small. BPO, I think, is quite similar as well. For BPO to scale, it really required the entire ecosystem to be on board with the same platform. And that in trade is something that's very, very difficult to do. Because in trade, you're never going to have 100% of your parties on the exact same platform. It would be nice, but it's very difficult. And there will always be a point in your trade transaction where you're going to need to hit print. You're going to have to submit some documents to a customs agency that requires a physical signature or that requires a stamp. For these reasons, when you have centralized systems that are seeking to solve the problem in trade is inherently a decentralized activity. It just doesn't work. So that's really why blockchain is is fundamentally different from these previous digital solutions, even though it is also a digital solution. Very, very interesting. And I like the analogies there. I guess the network effect really is the focus and and the potential opportunity to work potentially in conjunction with some of these technologies and finance instruments. So I guess moving on to my next question, where are the key opportunities for blockchain within the trade finance space? And what is R3 doing here? In the trade finance space, we've seen at R3 two major projects that are going into production this year. The first is about letters of credit, that's Project Voltron. And the second is a suite of open account solutions, which is Project Marco Polo. And both of these, I think, are exciting for very different reasons. The first is with Project Voltron, letters of credit are notoriously difficult and slow and very unpleasant to actually do. And so by having that on the blockchain, we've shortened the process from taking five to 10 days to taking less than 24 hours. And that is accounting for the different time zones and and things like that. Now, Marco Polo is a little bit different 
because open account is much more of a kind of wild west space, right? It means something different to everybody that uses that word. But really what Marco Polo has done in that project is seek to open opportunities for new types of finance. And that's really where the blockchain has its greatest opportunity. It's not just about digitalizing the process, which is critical as well, but it's about how do we enable finance at different parts of the trade transaction? How do we allow finance at, to the long tail of suppliers? And this is something that blockchain does really well. There's a number of other solutions that we have built on Corda as well, because like I mentioned earlier, Corda is just a blockchain platform itself does really nothing. So we rely on our partners to then build applications on top of that. So within the partner ecosystem, we have everything from trade credit insurance, open accounts, letters of credit, and all sorts of other solutions that are relevant in trade. Everything from logistics to maritime, we have payment now with the API link that we built, which enables Corda to be used with Swift GPI to allow payments on blockchain. So there's a whole lot of really exciting things going on, and it's really re-architecting the way that we do trade today in a way that I think is going to be great for small and medium-sized enterprises and is really allowing a lot more opportunities to offer finance in ways that we haven't done before. Very, very interesting. And thank you for clarifying and splitting out some of the different projects going on within R3. So just, I guess, just, just to reiterate and clarify, we get a lot of our readers and listeners asking us about what the key differences are. And also, as we prepare for Consortia 2019, which is BCR's conference in a few weeks' time, can you very quickly outline the difference and what the key differences are between the, these four projects? So R3, Corda, and Marco Polo, and also Voltron. Sure. R3 and Corda are kind of the same thing. R3 is the name of the company that builds Corda. Corda is the name of the blockchain. And Marco Polo and Voltron are both projects that are built using Corda. So they're built on our private permission blockchain. Excellent. Thank you. So now, I guess, a bit more of a tricky question. And we recently spoke to some of the architects at WeTrade last week, and they mentioned that having competition within the consortia spaces is good. So tell me, what are the key differences between the Corda platform, which R3 have built, and IBM's blockchain platform, which uses Hyperledger Fabric? Sure, I can absolutely do that. And I think they're right. I mean, when you have competition in this space, it's very, very important because competition is what leads to innovation. I think it's terrific that we're seeing all of these different platforms building, as well as all of these different solutions going to market. And there's definitely fundamental differences between Hyperledger Fabric and R3 Corda. Both of them are private permission blockchains, which is why you see so much traction happening in trade finance and in insurance for both of them, really. Because if you're looking at an enterprise blockchain solution, it really needs to be one that's suitable for an industry that is highly regulated and that does have a lot of reporting requirements. So in terms of the, the major differences between Fabric and Corda, it really boils down to the ability to scale and interoperability. Corda projects are all interoperable with each other. So if you build a trade finance solution on Corda, it can transfer assets and interoperate with a payment solution or a trade credit insurance application. So what this means for our members is you don't really have to build up every single piece of the application that you want. If you want to plug in trade credit insurance, just use a different app. So on Corda, you can do that. Whereas with Fabric, they are not interoperable between each other. You're building individual siloed business networks. And the second way that they're different is really in terms of how you can expand the network in different business networks. So with Corda, if you want to add another supplier or another bank, it's quite straightforward because we don't do global broadcast. We only do point-to-point -point transfer of data. Whereas with Fabric, they use channels. And what this means is every time you bring in a new entity onto the network, you need to build a new channel. And that increases engineering complexity and makes scale a little bit difficult. So we found that with a number of different applications that have replatformed from Fabric onto Corda, 
because of the problem that they ran into with channels where they couldn't scale up. Once you, if you have 25 nodes, that's fine. That's not really a problem. But once you have 1,000 or 10,000, then scale becomes very challenging with Fabric. Those are the two main differences between them. That's very, very interesting and, and very, very good answer. So channels versus point to point. I guess my next question is, is there any way or will there be any way that banks working on the Hyperledger Fabric platform will be able to interact with other banks working on the Corda platform? What are your thoughts here? I think that's going to be key in the future. So I think this is something that we're all working towards. And you're seeing a number of different initiatives in the industry. So one prominent initiative is the Universal Trade Network. And what this does is it looks at how to build the infrastructure for interoperability when it becomes possible. So the reason you don't see interoperability between different blockchain platforms today is because it just doesn't make sense. None of the different platforms are mature enough to make it sustainable to build bridges between them. And what I mean by that is, for example, it's possible to build a bridge between Hyperledger Fabric and Corda. And in fact, we've done it. In one of the earlier stages with Voltron, we did exactly that. We showed that there was a way to transfer electronic bills of lading from one to the other. But then as soon as you upgrade Fabric, it goes to a different version, that bridge breaks. So in Corda, we do have wire stability now. We do have our enterprise version now. So everything is backwards compatible within Corda. So Corda is stable, but certainly Ethereum, as one example, is absolutely not. So it wouldn't make sense to build a bridge today. Going back to the earlier question about how to make interoperability happen, what UTN is doing is looking at the three fundamental features you would need for interoperability once the platforms are ready. The three things that you would need for interoperability when the platforms are ready include communications protocols, identity framework, and data format. So basically what we're doing with UTN is really looking at how do you create a standardized state object for, I don't know, for example, an invoice. And so what that would mean is what are the fields that you would have in an invoice and how are those fields filled out? So for example, Am I writing my phone number with dashes between the numbers or with dots or with spaces or just all of the numbers together? That matters for blockchain, how that format is done. So once we've standardized that, then we could use those invoices across the different platforms. But that's just not the case today. So this is still very much a work in progress. Thank you very much. That's very interesting. And I guess it comes down to the point that standardization is absolutely critical for all parties, particularly if we're looking to solve the customer problem, which lies around the digitalization of trade using various different platforms, consensus, etc. And I guess we need to all work together as an industry to come to a place where traders, corporates, SMEs, et cetera, can benefit from these blockchain technologies because ultimately there seems to be a divide right now in the underlying technology and there are currently challenges with regards to interoperability, but it sounds like the industry is taking a fairly positive step towards the standardization, which is definitely something that's going to be required to enable different platforms to interact with one another albeit there are some inherent challenges around the actual cryptocurrency itself and various software upgrades, et cetera, that do remain challenges for the industry. So in terms of next steps, what are you most excited about? What are the next few years looking like for both R3 and also trade finance with respect to digitalization using DLT? I am also very excited. One of my biggest focuses right now at R3 is really building out our work in supply chain. Because what we found is as we've gone to pilot with these different trade finance applications that we're engaging corporates and they're asking us, okay, well, what else can we do next? Porta was built for regulated financial institutions, but there are plenty of other sectors that are just as regulated as banks. 
So, you know, we're seeing a lot of traction in aerospace and aviation and automotive as well. So different sectors where it becomes critical that you're able to track a particular part or a particular piece of data throughout the life cycle of the vehicle or the manufactured product. That's a lot of what I've been focusing on. In terms of R3 more generally, we're doing some really exciting things. And how this is relevant for trade finance is because when you think about trade, trade is very much about the exchange of data. I mean, we in general think about trade as being the exchange of goods, right? You have a buyer and a seller and they're shipping something between them. But in fact, for a bank, it's really about how do you get the data about those goods between different parties and how do you reconcile the data and make sure that it's correct. So a lot of what we've focused on recently is connecting different sources of data, which is what blockchain is great at. Because if you think about, for example, a cargo ship. So I'm a buyer and I'm waiting for the supplier to send over this container load of manufactured product. Between the time when those goods are put on the ship and I receive them, I don't know anything about them. I don't know if the ship has been lost in a storm. I don't know if the temperature has gone too high and say the pharmaceuticals that are in that container are spoiled, but the ship knows. There's plenty of data that that cargo ship is collecting. There's data on GPS, where it is, how high the waves are, the state of the containers. All of this is being collected, but because there's no way right now to connect these systems, it's not being shared. And it could. So a lot of what we've been focusing on is where are these sources of data? How can we use them? And how can we use them to open up new sources of financing and new opportunities, both for SMEs and for banks, to be able to interact and collaborate? So that's, I think, one of the most exciting things that we have happening right now. That's very, very exciting and very, very inspirational. It's really really good to hear that from you, Alyssa. So I guess just concluding what we've heard from you today, I guess a lot of the key challenges and also opportunities within our trade and supply chain space lie largely around connecting the dots. We should really be thinking about trade as the exchange of data, not necessarily the exchange of goods. And what's very interesting is the use cases for Corda technology to go beyond trade finance, right into outer space and other applications. I guess what remains key for us and here at Trade Finance Global is how can we help increase liquidity to small and medium-sized companies and also the underbanked, which is where the largest proportion of the trade finance gap comes from, particularly as you alluded to in your previous research at the ADB. So that's always a constant challenge and thinking point for us. So we continue to seek ways we can address that. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Alyssa, for your time with us today. Uh, Really appreciate you coming and talking to us. And we're really excited to hear some of your colleagues speak in a few weeks at BCR Consortia 2019. Yes, that's going to be great. Well, thank you so much for having me on. This was great. I really enjoyed this conversation and I'm looking forward to the podcast. Trade Finance Global have partnered up with Consortia 2019 to give our listeners an exclusive 10% off the event on the 21st and 22nd of May here in London. Simply use the discount code TFG2019 or visit tradefinanceglobal.com for more information. We look forward to seeing you in May, alongside many of the key players in bank consortiums, including WeTrade, Marco Polo, Comgo and Voltron. Thanks for listening to Trade Finance Talks. Be sure to subscribe to our podcasts at tradefinanceglobal.com.